This episode is sponsored by Grow Therapy. Grow Therapy was founded on the belief that quality mental health care should be accessible. It makes finding an in-network therapist easy. Go to growtherapy.com to find your match and let insurance pay for your therapy. Welcome to a place where you'll leave feeling whole. The Counseling Podcast brings at-home counseling right to you, focusing on self-care, self-expression, and breaking down barriers. Dr. Jacqueline and Dr. Stokes bring over 20 years of combined experience and a new sense of style to the word counseling. The two use humor and lighthearted conversation to explore these deeper feelings. Let's take the stigma away from counseling together. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Counseling Podcast. I am Dr. Jacqueline. And I'm Dr. Stokes. And we have a very special guest with us today, Sabrina Saro. So Sabrina, why don't you introduce yourself to our listeners? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Sabrina Saro. I'm an LMSW in New York, and I currently work for a small private practice called Gray Matters, which is located in the city, as well as the Hamilton Counseling Center for Hamilton College Upstate. Um, and my pronouns are they, them, theirs, or you can just call me Sabrina. And it's so great to be with you. We're very excited to have you here with us today. And how do vulvo vaginal conditions connect with sex therapy? I'm really excited to sort of just dive into this. So I think just to start off answering that question, uh, at least in my experience, when looking for sex therapy accredited programs or when looking um, to connect with different sex therapists or when looking um, to just explore more about the whole world of sex therapy, I've learned over the last three years and have noticed over the last three years that vulvovaginal vaginal conditions have often been left out of the conversation or left out of the picture. So just to begin, vulvovaginal vaginal disorders is a general umbrella term for anything that involves the urogenital tract. So this can encompass anything from urinary tract infections to reproductive autoimmune disorders like polycystic ovarian syndrome, endometriosis, fibroids. So it's really a, a wide sort of range. And I'm also trying to interrogate the language of vulvovaginal disorders as well, because I think it can be binary and, um, you know, can be erasive in some ways. So urogenital conditions is what I'm trying to say now. But how that connects to sex therapy. So again, as I was sort of saying, like, I think when we think of sex therapy, we're thinking maybe less about the biology sometimes that can sometimes inform or impact um, how folks relate or participate in sex um, or, or how that politic informs the body and informs how that word shows up in the body. But when I think of that question, I think of a whole world of people right now as we speak are experiencing and suffering from urogenital conditions. Um, and I feel like uh, sex therapy as it is, is not doing an adequate job to address those conditions. And so I, I feel like we actually can't talk about sex therapy without talking about urogenital conditions. And while those conditions might not affect everyone, I feel like I still struggle to actually find practitioners in the field who know what I'm talking about when I say vulvovaginal disorders or, or when I say, yeah, I work a lot with patients who have reoccurring urinary tract infections or I work a lot with patients who have benign, you know, prosthetic hyperplasia and people are looking at me and are like, how does that relate to sex therapy? You know, or, oh, that's interesting. Or I've I haven't considered, you know, sort of these more urogynecological conditions to be uh, proximate to sex therapy. And so when I think of that question, I really think of we need to make it part of sex therapy. That's the answer. And I don't think it is. And to my knowledge, I have yet to find a program that actually uh, trains or certifies mental health professionals in this specific domain that is connected to sex therapy. I don't see this when I come across programs. I haven't even heard of this in Columbia, in social work school, nothing. Yeah, uh, even... Even talking about sex therapy uh, or trauma-informed sex therapy, I've heard no mention of urogenital conditions. So yeah, my answer to that is that I want to make it a presence now. 
And how have, when clients come to you, yeah. how do you provide that for them? Yeah. So I have done a lot of work shadowing different providers over the last three years. And so there hasn't been, you know, I, I never say that I'm a certified like vulvovaginal or urogenital specialist, but I do say that I have done extreme research and have done programs with certified doctors, nutritionists, holistic practitioners, and do feel competent to help support, lead the path and provide guidance. So it's been a combination really of my own journey, plus me being in several programs over the years, PCOS programs, several bladder programs, uh, speaking to different doctors, asking to shadow different doctors, asking to just pretty much doing all the pro bono stuff that I can possibly do to amass knowledge um, until there is a program that exists that maybe could certify me one day. I'll create that one day. So like it doesn't exist yet, but I tell people that I do know what I'm talking about and I am a sufferer as well. I'm an experiencer of these things as well. And so really well connected in that sphere. So I put those in my, my bios and I usually <laughs> will explain that in consultation calls. That's great. And your compassion comes through and your empathy for your clients. And I think me and Dr. Stokes would also agree that you can be an integral piece for us who see couples that maybe, because I know that you say this affects relationships, especially with the sex part. So if someone is experiencing this and then they have that disconnect because I'm having this pain, it's, it's you know, it's impactful. You know, I like to also illuminate that my particular focus and emphasis is really working with Black, trans, gender variant folks around these issues as well, because just there are, I haven't found one Black urologist in my whole, like, <laughs> life, actually, <laughs> battling what I've battled. Not only is it a sex therapy issue, but it is absolutely a race and class issue. Then it becomes a, a larger issue of, like, finding urologists that are intentional and TGNC competent, queer competent, um, culturally informed, it becomes a whole other layer. So yeah, yes, yes. And yes, it is absolutely connected to, to sex therapy. And I think, or to couples therapy rather, or partnerships of any kind. Um, and I feel like there are partners and partnerships out there that are looking for specialists right now, or couples who are, or couples therapists who are well-versed in these things to help support with that. So I, I see, I see a huge want and learn and need in that area as well. What would be the most important for you to provide to therapists that you think are lacking those? What would be your biggest thing to, to give to those clients? Oh, definitely just affirming that what they are experiencing is 100% real. Understanding that when it comes to these urogenital conditions, it is life-threatening. It is suicide prevention to have practitioners who are adequately and competently trained in working with these urogenital disorders that are not only very misunderstood and, and uh, inaccessible to most folks, but also really affect pain every day on a deep level and often go... Um, just undershadowed or just underdiagnosed. So I think the first thing though is to actually alert alert the public and alert the audiences that these things actually exist and that there's like sort of to decode the misinformation also that I think exists around sex, aftercare, UTIs, um, antibiotics. Like actually I think there needs to be more psychoeducation around the vagina, around the bladder, around hormones, the pain-brain connection, the nervous system, histamines, it's to be overall more of this component. So I'd say that's definitely coming to mind. And then I think also something that's really important that I think needs to be taught is how to support our clients in advocating for themselves. So, you know, when I'm talking to my fellow Black patients, I have protocols, I have doctors, I have just ways to sort of appeal claims, ways to advocate for what you need, ways to file for exemptions if maybe you're in network, but you have vaginismus and nobody seems to know what that is and you, you need to see an out-of-network provider and you need to know how to file an exception, which, in, which most in-network uh, insurances won't, won't alert you that you can do that or won't tell you how to do that. 
So just really like helping my clients also understand what words to say, what words to stay away from, codes, billing, how to, how to ensure your doctor is writing a proper letter of medical necessity with the proper diagnosis code. You know, ways to check for NPI numbers to make sure your services are being covered. What to ask the urologist? What questions might you want to ask? Um, how do you differentiate if it's bladder pain or vaginal pain? What's the difference? Uh, what do all these words mean? What's the difference between burning during urination and burning after urination? Or what's the difference between pain in the vagina or pain on the vulva? What are the differences here? So I think it's, it's also like, helping your clients to be equipped with a reservoir of tools that they will need, especially if they are black, brown, indigenous, a person of color, gender variant in any way, disabled. They will especially need these toolkits in order to defend themselves when these doctors come out to erase them, invalidate their pain, dismiss them. It sounds like it's such a comprehensive approach. And it seems like you're trailblazing this area, Sabrina, right? This this seems like an area of mental health care, as you've noted, that is really, um, is it, individuals are not getting the services that they need. And you're coming in with this biopsychosocial, um, multiculturally informed approach. And I think it's so important that you're working with these different intersectionalities and you're looking at these at these individuals who are really in need. Uh, how how to, for our listeners, you know, um, how does a, how does an individual know when it's time to seek out a provider such as yourself to say, okay, look, this is a problem. What yeah. are some of those telltale signs? Sure. Any pain during sex, any pain during sex. I always tell my <laughs> all of my folks, uh, sex in any capacity in any kind should not be causing you any pain. Uh, any pain. Um, and if you are in pain for a brief moment or, or yes, I, I understand that there could be some context in which your body is adjusting or getting used to certain things or maybe getting used to certain positions and maybe there might be like blips of pain, but it should never surpass. If it becomes a question in your mind, seek a provider. If it becomes a, oh, I thought this would have gone away by now or, oh, this happened again or, oh, well, this position actually hurts and it feels really deep inside or... I'm bleeding after sex. My vagina is itching now suddenly, or there's discharge or anything. I'd say re- the first sign of that goes straight to a medical provider. Yeah, go straight to a medical provider. And, you know, most of the times folks will know to do that and get antibiotics, get a yeast tablet, whatever, whatever they might need, and they'll feel better for most, most people. But then there's a subset of us, which is growing actually, where we won't actually respond to the antibiotics or they might tell us, okay, yeah, you have a UTI and we'll take the antibiotics, but we'll still have symptoms that persist or we'll still have symptoms persist. Even if a culture starts to show up as negative or doctors will say, well, no more antibiotics because there's no bacteria showing up in these tests. Right. Or, or, you know, a doctor might say, uh, okay, you're having, um, whatever, irregular, irregular cycles, take the birth, you know, take the birth control pill or, or, you know, just these fast, easy approaches. I usually tell my clients to just really intuit, lean into your body, um, and really wait to watch if something still feels like it's lingering. If something feels like they're just sort of shoving a pill at you and telling you, Oh, well, that's normal. Um, you know, I think a part of this is also intuitive reading of the body. I, I usually tell people, If you feel like something is off and you are being told that it's normal, make sure you actually believe that assessment. Like if you yourself are not perturbed by it or distressed by it, and if you think, okay, this is just kind of a part of my body's fawn and flora, and and yes, it's normal, then listen to that. But if you have a gut feeling that like, okay, I took the antibiotics, but it still burns, or I took the antibiotics, but I'm still peeing every 10 minutes, but there's no they're not finding anything now, go to a provider right right away. Yeah. And seek a therapist right away who knows what they're talking about about these things. Just because I've met at least hundreds of people now over the last three years that don't have therapists that know about what what we're talking about today in this podcast um, and have doctors who say, oh, well, if the culture is negative, um, you know, then you don't have a UTI or, you know, or just... 
it starts to become extraordinarily more complex when people still have symptoms and still feel ill, yet doctors are treating lab tests versus people. So that's what I like to tell people. If you start to feel like your medical provider is treating a lab test and not you, it's time to find a therapist who can be your advocate. And as we know, with with certain conditions, especially conditions like this, it sounds like there's obviously the physical component, but then there's the psychological and emotional and cultural components. What are some of these psychological, emotional, and cultural components that you see sort of parallel these conditions physically? The medical gaslighting is, I think, something that just comes to mind uh, when I think of the physical implications of these things or just like doctors... um, not listening to patients' pain, not validating that pain is still there, not validating that something is still happening in the body. I think this also contributes to anxiety around intimacy, anxiety around starting to intuit your body, anxiety around, oh, if I have sex, am I going to get another UTI, which is then going to make me pay $75 to go to an urgent care again that might not find anything. It becomes actually a game of mental gymnastics after a while where um, we're so confused and we're so overloaded and we're so overwhelmed with, with just information and people who might not really be authentically listening to us that I think the, the psychological component starts to become compulsive thinking, intrusive thoughts, fear around intimacy, fear around touch, fear around sex of any kind, uh, fear of opening up interpersonally around these things, that there's a lot of stigma around urogenital experiences in the same way that there's a lot of stigma against STDs. Yeah, you know, these are also linked. This is also a part of sex therapy. How do we talk to people we want to have sex with about this? Or, or what, is, what does safe sex or safer sex look like for us now navigating these, these experiences? Or What are rituals that can help us feel safer if we are planning to have sex? Um, How do we talk to partners about this, people about this, family members about this? So I think the psychological component is huge. And then, yeah, the cultural component is, I think, even more is something to even be more highlighted just because there's also gender variant folks who may not feel safe in these spaces that are typically geared towards cis women in a lot of ways. Or doctors might erase that or, or, you know, there needs to be urogenital training for therapists. And then I think there really needs to be trans competent urogenital training and people who might be experiencing these symptoms who might be on HRT or who might be getting ready for gender affirmation surgeries and then might have side effects or, or yeah, or, or then might see bladder symptoms come up after they've done something. Or, you know, I think it becomes really, really nuanced. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think about that. Yeah. And then I, I just think also about the amount of financial duress that people go through because of these conditions as well. And the amount of in-network providers that really don't know what they're doing when it comes to this field. And, and you know, similar, I think, to the field of therapy in some ways, out-of-network providers, I think, are seen as better, be- better, better. I'm using that in quotations in some ways. And, and so I think like a lot of these great urologists out there who are awesome cost $1,600 for their first initial visit. And that, you know, and $875 for a follow-up and $525 if you're on the phone for more than nine minutes or just, just astronomically ludicrous prices that the average person could not afford. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about the physical implications or the psychological implications of just the financial costs of this. Um, and how a lot of the times pelvic floor therapy isn't covered by insurance or bladder installations aren't covered by insurance or TENS unit therapy isn't covered by insurance. Right. And so like navigating these loopholes as well. And then culturally, I just think like a lot of us black, brown, you know, BIPOC folks, and maybe all of us to some degree don't talk about urogenital stuff enough at all. We don't talk about wiping, aftercare with sex, lubes that might irritate the pH. We don't talk about foods that could be bladder irritants for some or just pain. Um, I, th- I think there's actually a narrative that, that sex is going to be painful, actually. Or I, I, I recall f- hearing that growing up. Like, it's going to really hurt. 
And like these these really toxic narratives that like we should be expecting that and waiting for that to happen, like just just stuff like that. Or, oh, it'll 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 get better. Or, oh, just give it another week and the burning will stop. Or, oh, that that's normal. Um, and sure, some of the time it is normal. But a lot of the time it's actually going unmissed and people are in chronic pain. This is how the chronic pain cycle begins. And people are in chronic pain for years, um, you know, and then and then they can't work or they can't their whole um, functionality becomes so fractured. Um, so that, those are some of the things that come to my mind when I think of sort of the, phys- the psychological, cultural components. Now, there are so many external factors to impact yes. that. And then again, if you are dealing with this, if someone is dealing with this and you don't even know how to really um, put that together and express what you're feeling, you're going to feel scared and alone. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you... Um, know of like online supports or support yes. groups for people to go to? Yes, I know so, so many. Yeah. And so, you know, like, oh, just the IC Network, the National Vovodinia Association, um, chronic UTI specialists. There are so many listservs. Um, uh, yeah, I have so many things in my head. Um, Facebook is a great resource. There are a lot of wonderful closed well-supervised groups on Facebook um, for people who have reoccurring UTIs, for people who have IC, for people who have BPH, a litany of different online resources for people to find providers, um, providers of color. Um, So yeah, that's also like a toolkit that I like to help equip in my clients' corners just so that they can have this as well. Um, Different apps, different um products or sort of like just different different things to watch out for uh, during sex or or how to have anxiety free sex if you know that sex can be a trigger for utis or bv or yeast um you know things to watch out for um yeah different books um you know like when sex hurts cystitis unmasked um yeah, so just like a whole library of resources um, and some great, you know, there's the Center of Vulva Vaginal Disorders is in New York City and in D.C. Their website has a lot of wonderful um, resources in it as well. Um, yeah, so just there, there are resources out there. Absolutely. Yeah. This is huge. This advocacy piece is so big because as you yeah. talk about these particular individuals, Sabrina, I, yes. I get the I get the feeling these people feel very alone in this issue, right? And so it sounds like it sounds yeah. like it's very important for folks to be yeah. educated and but yeah. also to be advocated for. That's what I'm sensing from you is that there's this strong advocacy piece. You're really trying to talk a little bit more about oh, that. What's definitely. going on there with I you mean, that, just... that compels you? There is enough pain, like when it comes to the TGNC and BIPOC communities, there is enough pain that most of us are experiencing on the day to day. So we do not need to be uh, trapezing these alternate layers of pain. Advocacy is huge. And, you know, in my journey throughout this, I really, really saw firsthand close up how little therapists know about what I'm talking about and how there's a whole subset of people who message me every single day asking me, do you know about therapists who know about, I see, do you know, do you know, do you, are there any therapists that you know about reoccurring UTIs that can help me with the emotional toll of UTIs that can support me, you know? And so it's, I'm almost envisioning like the word case manager is coming into my head and, and that's not it. Totally. But like, I really think actually there needs to be a new modality uh, arising that I want to spearhead around what is the marriage between therapy or, or therapy modalities that we can use. And I know there's a plethora of them, plus these very specific chronic pain conditions that I think need extra awareness, extra attention. I hear it a lot with cancer patients, right? Like, Therapy, therapists work with cancer patients, they're, you know, therapists work with terminally ill folks, but I never hear therapists working with folks who have urogenital experiences. So I think like we, we have examples of where this happens, but we need to expand that and really talk about how this is not just a euro medical thing. It's actually a, it's, it's a sex therapy thing as well. 
this needs to be in the training at sex therapy programs because because people are looking for that. Sex therapy goes into many things. I know those programs are wonderful and great, but I think like people are also really looking for that bent on this is not just sex therapy, but it's also sex therapy plus these conditions I'm managing possibly around the sex as well. Just more information, more information, more access, better access, preventative care. How do we prevent UTIs to begin with? What's the status on that? How do we do that? Misinformation around how to take care of your vagina, how to take care of your genitals, misinformation on all of that. Warning signs. What should a menstrual cycle be look like? Question mark. Your menstrual cycle shouldn't be giving you intense pain like that. That's no. Yeah. You know, it's not just cramps. You know, that's another narrative. Like, oh yeah, your period is just going to suck. It's terrible. You're going to have really, really bad cramps. And it's like, okay, but there could be people who have endometriosis and don't know it. Or, or there could be people who have prolapse or who knows, you know, like, I just think we need to be having different conversations. And there are so many gaps to be filled. And I wish we had yes. more time with you because you are so well versed on this. And I think you bring so much information and good information and resources that we would love to have you back on. And we want to thank you for spending this time with us today. Um, and so much we will be back next week for our listeners and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us here today on the counseling podcast with Dr. Jacqueline and Dr. Stokes. Please take this time to thank yourself for putting in the work. If this episode impacted you in any way, let us know with a loving and honest review. If you have any questions or want to continue the conversation from today, you can reach out to us at thecounselingpodcast at gmail.com and we can answer your questions right here on the show. Or you can find Dr. Jacqueline and Dr. Stokes on Instagram at docjacqueline and at dr.jeremiah.stokes.